so yeah, to me, it's all about participation. That's the that's the that's the be all and end all of, of reforming the AI. This is episode sixty six. This is the business of architecture. Helping architects conquer the world. And here's your host, Enoch Sears. Hello, Architect Nation, and welcome back to the business of architecture. I am your host, Enoch Bartlett Sears, and it is another beautiful day here in California. I really hope that it's great where you're listening in from. Hey, did you get on the early notification list for the Business of Architecture conference? You need to get on the list to access the early bird discounted tickets. Now, this is going to be the event this year for solo and small firm architects who want to run a more flexible and profitable firm and have fun doing it. Now, I've got a great lineup of top-notch speakers, but only those on the list will get first notice with all the deets. So what are you waiting for? Head on over to businessofarchitecture.com forward slash conference and get on the list. Now, another piece of great news for you. This is big. The Business of Architecture show has a sponsor. Wow. This means that I'll be able to continue to bring you the best hard-hitting interviews from battle-hardened architects and ambitious startups. Now, it's always been my goal here to inspire you and give you the support you need to have success in your career and business. And most of all, I want you to know that you're not alone. You're part of a larger architect nation. And you can learn from the mistakes and successes and be inspired by others who have gone before. Now, on this show, I ask the questions that I wish I had the answers to when I started out. You know what they say, one person builds the bridge so that others can walk over it. I really hope that I'm building a sturdy, useful bridge for you that will help you live the life of your dreams. Or at the very least, re-energize you and encourage you, provide a little bit of entertainment for you on a weekly basis. So... A couple of months ago, architect Stephen Burns, who's the founder of Archie Office, sent me an email offering to underwrite the Business of Architecture show. And, uh, you know, so what does the sponsorship mean? It means that the beginning and middle of every show, I'll be acknowledging the generous support of Stephen Burns and his team over at Archie Office. Now, I accept this, this underwriting only after careful consideration because it's always been my goal to be an independent voice for architects around the world. My primary allegiance is to you and to no one else. So it was kind of a big deal for me to personally to accept this sponsorship. You see, and this goes back to the way I was raised as a kid. I was raised with the idea that earning money is evil. I know, it sounds horrible. My grandfather, who was an awesome guy and a very successful political lobbyist for school employees' rights, he did a lot of good during his life, but... You know, he was a champion of the people. And once he told my mother that you don't get rich by being honest. Wow. I mean, what a way to influence the thinking of someone else. So my mom passed that kind of ideology and thought down to me. And I mean, what a psychologically damaging concept, you know. And it's really been something that I've struggled with. I think it's one of the reasons why I chose to be an architect because I didn't really... I wasn't in it to get filthy rich. I wanted to do something that I felt would really be able to impact the world and be able to express some creativity. So now, you know, having been in the business for a while and understanding how money works, I can see how damaging this concept is. This idea that, you know, earning money is somehow bad, that if you earn a lot of money, you must have ripped someone off. Some of the most giving people that I've known and that I've met are wealthy And they understand the relationship between money and giving value. They understand that the way you get wealthy, by and large, is by providing more value to other people than you take in return. But, you know, I think a lot of us architects, and I'd be interested to know your feedback and how you feel about this, you know, head on over to the page and uh, leave your comments in the show notes, but feel this way to a greater, lesser degree, that making a lot of money is somehow unholy or greedy. You know, as I said, we didn't choose this profession to get rich. We just want to make the world a better place and have fun doing it. So I've always had this little voice in the back of my head telling me it is more saintly to run the show without sponsors. But I digress. I'm getting off track here. You know, this is about the sponsorship. And obviously, I've overcome my own mental blocks about that. And I understand that by accepting underwriting for the show, 
I can make the show better. I can bring it to you. Plus, you know, when I'm sitting here spending all this time making the show, I can tell my wife that <laughs> it's helping to pay the bills. So having said that, the show's focus here on the business of architecture is a perfect fit for what Steven and his crew do at ArchiOffice. ArchiOffice is an integrated project management and billing software specifically for architects, and I am happy to give them a shout out on each episode as a token of gratitude for their generous underwriting of the show. Now, I did have the opportunity to meet Steven over in the AIA National Convention back in Chicago. Uh, it was great meeting Steven. He's a really stand-up guy. And you know what I love is he's just made it very clear that the purpose of the sponsorship is to support the business of architecture and make sure that this message reaches as many people as possible. So, Stephen, thank you for reaching out and you know offering to help me further the mission of the business of architecture because I did talk with Stephen, and he is a big believer in helping architects run better businesses. And that's what he's doing over there at ArchiOffice. So thank you, Stephen, and ArchiOffice and BQE Software. Now, let's talk about you. If you want to be famous, head on over to iTunes and leave a review of the show. I haven't read any of the reviews lately, but there are some great ones here. And I'm going to go ahead and read these out over the air. So thank you for those of you who've added reviews on iTunes. This is just awesome. And it really, it just makes my day. So first of all, I'm going to go back in time a little bit. I think I might have already given a shout out to Jess Stafford over at Mod Architect. You can check him out on the big time small firm Google Plus community. Now he says, make sure you have this one set to save all episodes. There have been many times I go back to this part of my podcast library to review Enix interviews, just like a favorite and valuable reference book. The only reason I give it four stars is that I hope Enix soon makes a custom backdrop or background that matches the super energy of his personality and show. <laughs> Well, Jess, I'm not quite sure when that custom backdrop will happen. I know me and my wife, you know, I have a home office. Uh, we do have a remodel in the works, so maybe that will happen. Uh, next one is from my friend Jeff Winnie over at Samich and DiBella Architects. He says, Enoch is great for architecture. Thanks, Jeff. He says, I enjoy listening to all Enoch has to say. He's passionate about helping architects to get back on track and become or stay successful. No ego here. These podcasts are great listening with helpful tips and ideas to get your firm noticed. It is time to change the perception. Architects must market themselves. Enoch will help. Also, make sure to check out his website for downloads, webinars, and lots of great more info. So thank you, Jeff. You know, I, I really appreciate your support. You're a great friend. Thank you very much. I have another one here. This is from Guillermo Sepulveda. And Guillermo, thank you so much for being uh, the first person to leave a review about the show in Spanish. She says, Uno de los mejores podcasts de arquitectura. I'm going to read it in Spanish and then I'll do the translation. Uh, he says, Este es uno de los mejores podcasts de arquitectura que he tenido la oportunidad de escuchar. Si bien la felicidad de vivir en la frontera me permite interactuar con inglés y español. En verdad, muchas felicidades Enoch por tu programa. Siempre sigo a la espera de cada nueva entrega. So Guillermo says, This is one of the the best podcast about architecture that I've had the opportunity to hear. And I have the pleasure of living on the border with, um, with the United States. So I have the opportunity to interact a lot with English and Spanish. So thank you very much, Enoch, for your program. I will always continue listening to it to every single new episode. So thanks, Guillermo. And thanks for humoring me with my gringo gavacho accent. Let's see, Jared here says, fantastic concept and flawless execution. Thank you, Jared. You know, this is a newer review. I hadn't seen this before. He says, it's easy to forget that running an architecture practice means that you are a business owner first and architect second. The first three stars are just for having an architecture podcast about the business aspect of the profession. The other two stars are for having a flawless execution on the subject. The content is diverse and explores design builds, arch architect as developer, marketing and social media, so practitioners, large firms, liability, and architect entrepreneurs. The episodes are generally about 45 minutes in length, which is perfect for my work commute. While I personally look forward to seeing more architect as developer interviews, it would be nice to see a green practice interview. Thank you, Jared, and thank you for your feedback. I hope that you get a kick out of this as you're on your commute listening to this shout out over the air, and I will definitely line up uh, 
uh, green practice interview. Drop me an email and let me know kind of what specifically you'd like to hear for that, and I'll be sure to get that in the works. The last uh, review here I'm going to read is from Developer in Training. Uh, no name provided, kind of flying under the radar here. But he or she says, great range of business material, five stars. Enix podcasts and website are a great resource for architects with little or no formal business education. The podcasts cover a wide dearth of material from architect as developers, my aspiration to marketing strategies. While I have not found all of his collaborators quite as efficacious, Enix's willingness to engage other experts to help architects be better business people is greatly appreciated. He also quickly responds to any email I've sent him. I highly recommend. So I have an idea. I know who you are, and I want to just thank you. Thank you, everyone, for those. Thank you for those of you who are listening who have indulged as I've you know given the shout-out to these people who have left these awesome, awesome reviews. Made my day. So thank you, Jess. Thank you, Jeff, Guillermo, Jared, and then uh, Developer in Training. Really appreciate it. Now, we have a power-packed interview today. I loved this particular interview. I hope you like it too. Today's guest is architect Stuart Magruder. Stuart is a powerhouse of energy, passion, and a great designer to boot. After working for the firms of Eric Owen Moss and Richard Meyer, Stuart headed out to start his own practice in 2005. He is a past president of the Los Angeles AIA chapter and was given the Young Architects Award in 2011. So Stuart is very involved in the AIA and community activities. In addition to running his firm, he just got a lot of energy. Now, as a member of the Los Angeles Unified School District Bond Oversight Committee, recently Stuart made national news because he was not reappointed to the committee because he was asking some hard questions. Now, this really piqued my interest because Stuart was making a stand and because he was standing up for what he believed in, he was dismissed from this committee, which is supposedly an oversight committee. So I just had to get him on the show, ask him about that. I'm also going to ask him a little bit about, you know, starting a firm and his experience as a sole practitioner. And he also answers one question, which is going to be in not this week's episode, but the next episode about how can you have a design oriented practice if you're starting out? How do you get to that point? So I think you're going to really love today's interview as we discuss the ethical implications of being an architect and our civic responsibility. So without further ado, here's the show. Welcome to the Business of Architecture. Thank you. Good to, good to be with you. Look forward to our conversation. Yeah, you bet. So I don't know if it was a month ago, but you hit national news. I've seen articles on you uh, about you know, the issue that we're going to talk about, you know, Huffington Post, L.A. Times you know, all over the place. But all I'm going to tell our listeners is that it dealt with something with the Los Angeles uh, School District, and I'll kind of let you take it from there to kind of tell us the backstory about, you know, what happened there and some of the underlying issues that are really going on in this situation. Yeah, no, it, it um, you know, at, at heart, it was kind of a um, a small D democracy issue, and it was an issue about uh, um, oversight and making sure that the overseer is not um, you know, at the whim of the overseen, you know, so those are really kind of the issues that govern this. And so the, <laughs> I don't um, like that, how you put that. <laughs> yeah. The, um, the Los Angeles Unified School District has, um, uh, succeeded in passing a series of bond measures, um, starting in, I think, 98, if I'm correct, either 97 or 98, um, with Proposition BB. And so the citizens of LA have agreed to tax themselves now up to $20.5 billion, so a huge amount of money. It's the wow. largest single public works program in the history of the U.S. So it's a phenomenally big expenditure. It's phenomenally important because it's about educating our kids. Um, you know, and we're really talking about educating, you know, disadvantaged, by and large disadvantaged and minority children. There's about 75% free and reduced lunch in the district. So that means your, your, uh, your income level, I don't know the exact number, but it's pretty low for a household. Uh, uh, so it's it's about how we educate, you know, the entire uh, city. It's about how we look at, um, you know, taking care of making sure that everybody has, has access to, you know, the promise of democracy and the promise of, of, of making something out of themselves. Um, so part of what got this first proposition passed, because it failed the first time, uh, it, it went on ballot. Part of what got it passed was the creation of this Citizens Bond Oversight Committee. And it was a group 
composed of stakeholders, so um, interest groups, really, uh, to be blunt about it. And um, it's a body of 15 um, uh, people that are um, 13 of the 15 are uh, appointed by the interest group that is in the bond language. So in my case, it's the American Institute of Architects, LA chapter. And um, the Board of Ed is very clearly in the memorandum of understanding between uh, the Bond Oversight Committee and the Board of Ed. It says the BOE shall appoint the nominee from the AIA Los Angeles. Um, one of the Board of Ed members decided that she was not happy with the scrutiny that I'd been putting a very controversial $1 billion iPad for every student initiative under. And I've been objecting to this technology initiative from the start for a number of reasons, mostly because um, it's a completely unplanned effort where they're essentially throwing technology at kids with no preparation of the teachers, no integration with the curriculum, um, and really no thought about how it's going to be used. Um, so it's iPads for kindergartners, and initially it was iPads for seniors in high school. Um, we succeeded in slowing them down. We su succeeded in having them test laptops for high school students. But at root, it's still a very problematic program because it's all about um, really providing technology under the guise of it being used for you know pedagogical or teaching reasons, but it's really just there for the test. And it's this new... Um, Common Core Standards Test, which I'm not against at all, but there's this drive to make it digital, which to me is also really questionable as, an, as a priority. So as a consequence, the district said, well, we need to spend a billion dollars to have uh, every student have a, a device they can take the test on. Um, so I object, objected to this, and when my appointment came back up before the Board of Ed, uh, Tamar Gallatson, who's a board member from the richest district in LAUSD, the West Valley area. Um, she uh, moved to not include my, you know, she moved my name off of the motion. Uh, I was part of a motion with another um, colleague, Barry Waite, who was uh, from the California Taxpayers Association. So uh, Barry got appointed. I didn't. And I think they thought I was going to kind of roll over and just kind of accept it. And instead, based almost mostly on my wife, who is a teacher, a professor at Cal State University, Dominguez Hills, um, and this little community we've kind of fallen into of people really concerned about education in L.A., um, they were all furious, and they just were kind of off the hook about how upset they were by what had happened and how undemocratic it was, et cetera. You know, in the back of my mind, I was thinking, hey, this is great. I've got fewer pro bono hours now because I'm doing all of this for free. You know, it's completely uncompensated. Um, and at the, at the time, and now I am back on as a member, but also as I'm on the executive committee, so I'm going to, you know, pre-meetings, you know, for the, the monthly meeting. And um, I guess the one benefit is I have parking provided for me downtown at the, uh, at the LAUSD headquarters. That's about it. Um, so we, we just, you know, push back. And what I did right away was start to get to um, the fourth estate or the press. And I realized that, you know, I'm basically nobody and I have very little, you know, authority or power, really. And the only way I was going to get anywhere was to engage the press. And I'd already developed relationships with uh, some of the folks at the L.A. Times who'd been writing on this iPad debacle. And um, they were covering the story, of course, of, of Tamar's kind of uh, uh, run against me. Um, and uh you know, we got some good articles um, by the education writer and, uh, for the for the paper, and then there's some editorials in the LA Times on it, and then um, probably, you know, arguably their most um, kind of uh, well known and 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 uh, I don't know what the right term is, but um, kind of well known and uh, impressive writer or columnist. Um, wrote uh, a column on me on, on a Sunday as a Sunday column, and uh, his name is Steve Lopez. And um, he got so much feedback from the article that he ended up writing a column on Wednesday, uh, the following Wednesday as well, after I 
since he's been successfully reappointed to the committee. So um, I think the story got picked up by NPR, or at least by the local um, uh, NPR uh, affiliate, uh, KCRW. Um, you know, I was interviewed on KABC Talk Radio a couple of times. Um, and it's all because, you know, I, I kind of reached out to the press and gave them, you know, gave them this story about kind of a real misuse of power by the, the Board of Ed person and, um, uh, you know, this attempt to kind of limit oversight on something that the public is, is really keenly aware of, of the need for oversight on. Um, you know, so, so the, the technology initiative, you know, every time I talk to somebody who is aware of it, but isn't in kind of the, the, the weeds, uh, of it with me, um, you know, somehow with the district or whatever, uh, they're all furious that, you know, we're spending all this money for iPads. Um, you know, and, and what scares me is that, um, you know, we're using about a billion dollars of the current, uh, proposition, which is Prop Q. And it's a seven billion dollar bond. So we're using one seventh of those funds for this, you know, Wi-Fi and, and, and iPad laptop initiative. And at the same time, we've got these tremendous needs for, um, Something like forty billion dollars, according to Mark Hovatter, who's the head of facilities, which is he's basically the top, you know, he's the main client at LUSD for all the you know construction and, and renovation work. And that forty billion would be to cover this kind of master planning effort that was done um, a couple of years back to assess what spaces and renovations needed to happen at every campus to make them just you know work effectively as a place of learning, you know, based on today's needs. It's not like it's you know building swimming pools in every elementary school. It was just, you know, we need an art room in this place. We need a science lab in this place, those sorts of things. Um, so a $40 billion need for new or renovated facilities. And then on the maintenance operation side, there's a $12.9 billion need you know, for funds over the next 25 years. So it's a tremendous amount of money. You know, we have tremendously underfunded educa education here in California. And when our leaders take money to pay for technology, when the public thinks this is really a construction bond, you know, it really puts at risk the public trust and the public willingness to tax themselves in the future. So that, that was my other big concern is like both my kids go to LUSD schools. We've had a fantastic experience in them. Um, but I am aware of how challenged the facilities are. And, you know, I go see, you know, friends at private schools and, 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 um, they're, you know, phenomenal facilities and, and I want to do the best I can to make sure that kids who, uh, you know, aren't born into money have access to good education. It's really, I think, an important thing for democracy. So, so that's my long spiel on, on, you know, my, my, uh, the political fear around the, uh, the iPad debacle here in LA. All right. Thank you, Stuart. So I just wanted to take a minute here to thank Archie Office for underwriting today's show. Hey, architects, let's admit it. We didn't go to architecture school so we can spend the better part of our days dealing with paperwork, billings, and project management. Archie Office is a software package that provides the tools you need to run a productive and profitable firm while freeing you up to do what you love most, design great architecture. So thank you, Archie Office, for underwriting today's show. Now back to our interview. And what form did your initial uh, protest take or your, your reticence? Oh, in terms of uh, my criticism of the initiative? Yeah, if you could just you walk know, me through, like you're yeah, telling yeah. a story, you know, so you're sitting in the boardroom. I mean, how does it come up? You know, how, does, how do you bring up the point, hey, wait a second? Yeah. Yeah, we'd been kind of prepped about this thing coming down the, down the road from the superintendent. It's really a guy named John Daisy, who's the superintendent of the of LA Unified, who was pushing this initiative. And so we're we're told that this might be coming, and then he actually comes and presents it to us, which is unusual. Uh, it's the only time I've seen him at the, our board meetings uh, during the two years I've been on the committee. And do you and have any presents... do you have any clue why he would be presenting that as opposed to another another initiative? Well, I think he was just you know extremely um, behind it. Is his, his uh, he thought was important to move the education of our kids forward, yep. and so he came and presented it. And um, you know, I just had a lot of concerns about how it was being put up, and so I ac actually questioned him on the spot, you know, about what he was saying and the implications of it. And you know, 
technology in the classroom is is a new thing. It's very controversial. Um, there are a lot of problems with it, and there may be a lot of benefits to it. It's not like they're a magic wand that will change a failing school and make it better. It's all about, it's just basically technology is a, is a, it has always been, you know, uh, a chalkboard. You know, it's a new version of a chalkboard. And there's some great things about an electronic chalkboard that can go to the internet and do stuff. But it has to be integrated into, you know, the pedagogical approach that teachers take. It's not something that just teaches the kids, you know. That's just not the way it works. It has to be thought through. So I was just raising questions about how is this going to work? How are you training the teachers? You know, what's up with the content? And then on top of everything else, the most kind of infuriating thing maybe in my mind about this that I kept hammering on, there are kind of two things. First was because it's bond funds and because lawyers had to do backflips to justify the idea that, that, that bond funds are being used to buy technology. Which, you know, if you're buying Wi-Fi technology to, you know, wire school up, I'm fine with that. But if you're buying the actual paper and pencil, which I consider an iPad to be a modern paper and pencil, it doesn't make any sense for it to be bond funds. So the lawyers had to do backflips to justify this. And because it's bond funds that are paying for the, uh, the devices, they can't leave the school. So we have a one-to-one -one technology program, and there's all this noise about trying to close the digital divide. But the kids who could use that la that laptop or that iPad at home with their families online, checking out stuff, reading books, whatever it might be, doing their homework, can't take it home. So it's you know, you know, it, it's got such limited utility because you know when you're in a class, being in a class is about interacting with the teacher and your and your fellow students. It's not about looking at a, an iPhone or an iPad or a laptop, right? Yeah, yeah. You know, by and large, education is about interacting with people. That's how you get educated. You don't get educated just by looking at a screen and being a passive recipient. You interact with people. Um, at least that's my opinion. Um, so, so the insanity that they can't go home just drives me up the wall. And that then also means that they can't put the textbooks on the devices because the kids can't, can't take them home. So there's no point in having them on the devices. But so they're still, you know, kids still have these heavy textbooks that are lugging all over the place. So there are all these things that it could do, which would be great. I mean, if it was just simply an electronic reader and you had a thin electronic reader rather than four heavy, massive textbooks to carry around, I think that would be a huge win for education. You know, I think that would actually be, that would move the ball forward. Kids could study in the car easily. Sure. They could study, you know, it just, it would work. Um, or at least that would help it work uh, a little bit better, but that hasn't happened. Um, so that, that, that's kind of, you know, one piece that, um, you know, I found really just, is crazy about the the idea of using bond funds to do this. It's, it's like we backed ourselves into a corner, um, you know, and, and and haven't figured out how to how to really make this as useful as it can be. Was um, it Stuart? Was it intimidating at all for you to uh, question the superintendent there uh, in the midst of all the people who were looking on at that time? You know, it really was. I have to be honest with you. It was one of those things where. Um, I kind of, you know, complained to my wife that I was just, I hated going to these meetings because it was really tense. And, you you know, I knew that I was going to be, you know, me and a couple other people were raising objections, but I was by and large the figurehead of, of the question asking. And it was very intimidating to, to do that. And, you know, I always came back from the meetings kind of wiped out and exhausted because, <laughs> you know, you, you know there's there's a huge amount of, you know, the challenge with an oversight committee is there's a huge amount of peer pressure that governs how we interact as, as humans. And your job as an overseer is to be critical and is to ask questions, is to be, you know, um, direct and clear about what you think doesn't work. And we were basically trying to, they were trying to railroad this thing through us, which is part of the pressure Daisy was trying to bring. And, uh, by showing up to present this to us the first time, um, and, you know, uh, so yeah, it was not, it, it wasn't, um, it wasn't easy. I'll put it that way. Yeah. Can you tell me, tell me a little bit about the conversation in your mind that's going on there? Um, I imagine part of you saying, you know, Stuart, just let this slide. I, I don't know if it was, if you were saying that all, but kind of tell me about what was, what was going on in your head at the moment this, this whole exchange is yeah. happening. Yeah. I mean, well, to me, the, the real thing that was, that was driving me crazy was that, it was really clear that this was not a well thought out program. 
And that is maybe at root the thing that drove me up the wall the most because I'm, I'm an architect. I like to plan. All I do is plan things out, right? I technically, as an architect, I don't do anything, mm. right? I don't do anything but draw on paper. So all I do as a professional is plan things out. And then someone else builds them. So that's all, that's, that's my, that's my, that's my, that's ingrained in my psyche is to, to plan things out right. And I'm, you know, pretty good at putting together a set of, of drawings and drawings that convey the, you know, design intent really well and they're clear and, and so on. That's what I take pride in. So I was kind of pulling my hair out hearing about this program that I knew was completely harebrained and completely unplanned out. And I felt stupid eventually, kind of in retrospect, looking back. It really is all about the test and was almost nothing to do with kind of pedagogical advantage for our kids. So we were spending all this money, all this money that is going to be obsolete in two to five years, you know, as the technology turns and advances and the iPads are obsolete. Um, you know, we're spending all this money and it's only really so that kids could take a test once a year. Mm. And that, you know, I, mean, I that... even suggest, I even suggested, you know, why don't you, you know, investigate, you know, leasing or renting the devices when you need them from the private sector. I'm sure you could create an industry where you could spend, you know, maybe it's $10 million each calendar year on testing instead of, you know, $1 billion, you know, uh, you know, every three or four years on, on the entire enchilada buying this kind of, you know, Rolls Royce of, uh, of laptops and, and so on. So, yeah. you know, so it was, it was, uh, it was really just my kind of dismay at how poorly you know, how poorly uh, thought out the program was. Was there was there any part of you that questioned your line of reasoning that basically said, listen, you know, I, I, I'm only here, you know, maybe a couple times a month. Uh, superintendent and his staff, you know, they've been working on this and they have probably all sorts of things behind the scenes that I don't necessarily know about. Who am I to, to question or, you know, maybe I should just let this slide. Was there any part of you that kind of was saying that? You know, to be honest, there wasn't much of that because, um, and I think it's probably due to the kind of the influence of my wife and the fact that she's really um, engaged and interested in how we educate people. That's what she does. That's her expertise. And so we, you know, the dinner table conversation over the years, the decades that I've been married to her, her mother was an English teacher in high school. You know, it's often been about kind of education and, 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 and that sort of stuff. So... Um, I didn't question what they were doing because it was so clear and there are a lot more detail I could go into if we had, you know, three hours of time um, uh, where they just did not think things through and the, and the program was just so harebrained. It didn't take much digging, unfortunately, to realize that this program had so many holes and we actually gave them, I, I drafted up the first draft and we had a, a subcommittee on our bond oversight committee of a technology subcommittee just for this issue. And, and I drafted, I think 26 or some ridiculous amount of questions for them to answer. Mm. And Steve English, who's the chair of the committee and a really, really good leader. And we honestly don't agree on, on this stuff, but he, he's very focused out process. And, and so we get along because we're both rigorous and focused on answering questions to make sure things work well for our kids. He's very committed to educating kids just like I am, you know, educating all of LA. Um, although we see the technology thing differently, but, uh, working with Steve, you know, we developed this list of, you know, some, you know, score of questions and, um, you know, they basically never answered them. Yeah, they basically ignored the questions that we had and said, oh, we'll get back to you. So, you know, I didn't doubt myself too much because as we get, got more and more into it mm -hmm. and they gave us more and more of their kind of sketch of the mm -hmm. pro of program, it was clear that the thing was so poorly put together and it was such a massive, massive fiduciary, you know, mess up. They were just not, you know, I'm paying them, you know, my share of these, these, <laughs> these bonds. And it was clear that this was just, we're throwing money away. And that's the sort of thing that, you know, joke about, you know, what turns you a Democrat into a Republican is you get mugged. You know, <laughs> that other, my new joke is, you know, the best way to become a Republican is to, is to try to interact with, uh, you know, the, 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 the education bureaucracy in terms of, you know, this sort of stuff. So, 
you know, it just was stunning how we were not, you know, there wasn't really a concern about spending the money well. And that was really frustrating to me because I knew that, you know, we don't have enough money to do what we need to do for the district. And we're spending all this money, you know, uh, on something that's just not well thought out. And so uh, this conversation went on for how long in terms of was, the different meetings uh, over the time? Yeah, it was period. probably about a year. I, I'd have to okay. kind of look at my notes, but it, 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 it um, took a while to kind of churn through. So they were pushing this for about a year, and the reappointments came up, and how, how common is it to have someone who has a, you know, an appointment to basically not get renewed? It has never happened. Okay. <laughs> it, it's, I mean, it, it literally, I mean, just to be really clear, it's now the, the memorandum of understanding or MOU is not law because it's not passed by the legislature, but it's a contract between this bond oversight committee and the board of ed. And in legal language, which I'm by no means an expert, but, um, the word shall is exhortative. It's like you have to do that. So the con, the, the MOU literally says the board of ed shall point. So they don't have leeway to decide whether or not I'm the right person, unless I've got business in front of the district or, you know, I'm some sort of felon. There, there are things that they, you know, they check your background to make sure you're kosher, but that's about it. So it has not, there's, they can't weigh in on my political beliefs, my religious beliefs, you know, my thoughts about technology. All that's completely off the table. Mm. So they can, it's not about them liking me. Yep. It's about the fact that the interest group that I represent has appointed me. So they, they have to appoint me, you know, to, to, um, you know, allow my, my seat on the board to take place. So it's never happened before. Um, and you know, it, it just, it infuriated so many people. Um, you know, and that was, you know, that was a sign to me that there was something about this that was, that was meaningful. And how did the um, reinstatement come about? You know, it, we, it was it was essentially through um, just a, a motion. One of the um, uh, board of ed uh, uh, members, uh, uh, Bernard Kaiser, um, and his chief of staff uh, were kind of behind me from the start, and they there were three votes that were for me, and then um, two votes that were definitely against me, and then one vote that was that was that was kind of the swing vote. And Kaiser, who's always been behind me, and um, uh, they they put out a motion to reappoint me to the to the BOC, the Bond Oversight Committee. And um, what they did for kind of face saving reasons um, is, you know, we knew about what the meeting when the meeting was going to be, and we had, you know, a dozen people there to speak on my behalf. I didn't go to the meeting so that I wasn't seen as kind of rubbing anything in anybody's face. And, um, and the item was put on the consent calendar so that it also could just pass without conversation. And it would allow Tamar and Monica Garcia, the other person who's a big supporter of this technology effort, to save face, essentially. So I was fine with that and, and it, it came up for consent. And, um, uh, uh, interestingly, um, uh, Tamar Gallatin did decide to bring it up and, and, you know, Kind of bad mouthing some more, but then she got outvoted. So we had, <laughs> we'd, we'd worked on the swing vote. Uh, had, we had some connections who were able to um, talk to Dr. Ladovic, who's the chair of the board of ed, who was the swing vote, and he voted uh, in my favor. So we won four two. And luckily, none of the people who were there who were there to speak for me had to speak because it just was taken care of and voted, mm. and you know it was, it was done. So. So it was good. It was it was a real nice, you know, example of small time democracy in action, you know, which was neat, neat to see. And and it also was, um, I think, an example of, uh, you know, um, really kind of where the value of having architects engaged in public life is. It's, you know, yeah. our thought process is valuable to the public, and um, uh, you know, especially when we're talking about things that, um, you know, don't benefit us directly. I think we have a lot of um, you know, a lot of authority in in, in the public sphere. So um, you know, this was an issue where I had no skin in the game besides my own passion for educating, you know, our future citizens or our current citizens, our soon-to-be voting citizens. You know, and uh, um, you know, Tom Maine supported the effort, and 
you know, a lot of a lot of good architects got engaged. And Mickey Solomon for the AIA was great supporting it, and got some great support from the you know California Council of the AIA as well. Uh, so it was you know it was a nice it was a nice uh, a nice process, and I was happy when it was over. <laughs> yeah. Well, I I just want to thank you, Stuart, for, um, from Architect Nation, from all the the listeners and the community here at Business of Architecture for you know, setting that example and making a stand for something that you just believe in. That's, that is inspiring. So thank you for doing that. Yeah, no, no, definitely my pleasure. And nice to be in a position where, you know, we can kind of make a difference. I think that's the important thing. And, you know, again, I go back to some, we talked about before the, the tape was running, but just, um, you know, I think it's the more that, that uh, architects can be involved in our public life, I think the better we'll do as a, as a culture, just because we do bring a, I think a good process for thinking about um, how to, to, to make changes happen and how to, you know, help, you know, um, communicate uh, new ideas to the public. Um, so, you know, it, it does mean we have to be a little more willing, though, to, to be in the line of fire. And I, I you know, I'd love to see more architects, uh, you know, kind of jumping in the trenches, as I put in the commencement speak at speech at SciArc this uh, this past September, you know, and, uh, we need more more architects in the trenches fighting some of these political battles. Uh, it's, it's really going to not only benefit our profession, but help, you know, help kind of maintain the quality of our built environment, which is so important on, you know, so many levels now with all the challenges we've got with population and climate change. And, you know, the list goes on, right? Yeah, well, let's, let's step back for a little bit since you're going down that road, but talk a little bit about architects' kind of ethical responsibility that we have to our communities at large. And I, I've seen it in your work from the work I've seen on, on your website and then also just talking to you now, Stuart, and your experience that you recently shared with us. You know, how does that drive your both your design and then also just the way that you uh, volunteer for things like the AI? Take me a little, tell me a little bit about that and um, maybe some suggestions yeah. for how other architects could, you know, how, how you think they should get involved. Yeah, I mean, I think, I'll be honest, I think the the number one thing architects should do is um, they really need to, to get involved with the AIA. And I'll be honest with you, there's a lot about the AIA that I really hate. I mean, I really have a lot of problems with the way the organi- organization runs. What? You know, I, What's that? Give me an example. Well, I, it, it, my jaw was on the floor when I realized that Julia Morgan was the first woman to win the gold medal from the national body this year. I mean, I couldn't, I was like, the first one? Are you serious? <laughs> I mean, that's just insane, right? I mean, it's just crazy. Yeah. Um, and, you know, there's a, there's a, I mean, there's, there's kind of a, at times there's a real reticence to accept change and to embrace, you know, our diverse, you know, America is an incredibly diverse nation, you know, much more so than a lot of other countries. And I think that's where our strength lies. I think it's always lying, laying yep. in that diversity. Uh, you know, I'm an immigrant, you know, a couple hundred years ago, but I'm still, you know, I'm, I'm the kid of an immigrant. Yep. Um, so I think, you know, I think that, uh, that kind of, um, th- there's some tendencies in the AI that, that, that will only change though when we have, you know, the best and the brightest and the most talented designers in particular. That's I, I in LA, I, I'm always pushing on the talented colleagues that I know who are really good designers to be involved in the AI. Because, um, you know, we need to focus on what we're best at, which is designing, and we need to have people who can do it really well, pushing the area to be, um, to be kind of engaged in the right things. And when you have, when you have passionate designers, uh, involved, they'll, they'll bring that passion to how we talk about political battles and, you know, um, you know, how we budget our, our, our monies and how we treat our, you know, uh, up and coming, uh, young architects or interns or whatever we decide to call them these days. Um, so, you know, you look at someone like, you know, Julie Eisenberg of, of Koning Eisenberg, who served on the board with me, who is fantastic. And Patrick Tai of, you know, Tai Architecture, who is fantastic. And, you know, you know, Jim Favreau and all these great designers, and we get them on the LA board. And that's a wrap for another show about the business of architecture. To get more resources about how you, as an architect, can run a rewarding business that is both fun, flexible, and profitable, visit businessofarchitecture.com and click the Join button to claim your free account to Business of Architecture Insider. 
As a member, you'll have access to free tools and resources to help you get more clients, start a new firm, and much more. You'll also get access to my book, Social Media for Architects, where you'll learn how to use Internet tools for fun and for profit. Until next week, this has been The Business of Architecture. Views expressed on the show by my guests do not represent those of the host, and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, pledge, warranty, contract, bond, or commitment, except to help you conquer the world. Bump music credit to Ben Folds 5, Do It Anyway.